So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next couple of speakers. Uh, what's near and dear to my heart, mathematics and biology. And so our first speaker is, is coming to us live from Germany. And this is uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lohmann, who's the head of neuroinformatics at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics and Tübingen General Hospital. She will be talking about what we can learn from the magnetic resonance imaging of the human brain. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to give this talk. I'm very sorry that I cannot be there in person. Uh, when I look at the screen from my side, it seems there's already a, a lot of sunshine on your side. And here it's already getting dark and cold and wintry and everything. So I'd ra much rather be at your side than, than over here. But thanks very much for inviting me. So let's just get started. So I'm going to talk about magnetic resonance imaging of the human brain. So, uh, oops, I hope you can see the, uh, sorry about the, the uh, I'll try to get the page fit better. So, so this is what MRI looks like. I guess many of you have already been in a scanner like this, or so you have a patient table and you have the uh, magnetic uh, bore where, the patient is uh, pushed in and then images of the brain or some other body parts are being taken. And this is what images look like. And there's been a huge progress. So MRI was invented around 40 years ago. There was a Nobel prize that was awarded to uh, Sir Peter Mansfield and Paul Lauterbourg. And you can see the very first images to the left of 1978 and look what they looked like uh, at that time. And then a couple of years later, 1999, image quality has improved uh, tremendously. And uh, to the right, you can see an image of uh, 2012 and you see how crisp it looks. And it's really wonderful how much progress there has been over the years. Now, what about uh, the field strength uh, that we use in these scanners? So as a reminder, 0.5 Gauss, that's about the Earth's magnetic field. 50 Gauss is what you typically have in a fridge magnet. And 1,500 Gauss is about the magnetization in a sunspot. And 10,000 Gauss is one Tesla. And a typical clinical scanner has around three Tesla. So it's an enormous, uh, enormously strong magnetic field that we use. It's amazing what it does, but and that it's actually completely harmless. There have never been any adverse side effects uh, observed in human patients. And this is what images then look like. So you get slices of the brain. Uh, this is imaged at three Tesla and you can see uh, lots and lots of detail of, of the human brain. And here's another image of, of basically the same data set. So you see um, the coronal, sagittal and axial slices through uh, the brain. And you see all the detail. It's a bit, I don't know if you can see the, the cursor as I move it here. So this, this would be the, the ventricles. So liquid in, in the brain and, and the uh, uh, darker areas uh, are the gray matter and the brighter areas are the white matter, which corresponds to basically the cables that connect brain areas. And nowadays we use even stronger field strength. In our Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, we actually have a 9.4 Tesla uh, magnet, which is uh, one of the uh, strongest magnets that are currently used for, for human imaging. And you can see incredible details here. So these tiny little white dots, for instance, those are blood vessels in the brain. And you can see almost fibers uh, uh, coming out of, of certain brain areas. So it's, it's incredibly detailed. And look at the cerebellum here. I don't know if you can see it to the back of the brain. It's incredibly detailed. But today I, I do not really want to talk about anatomical images, even though anatomical images are what are mostly used in clinical practice. But there are in fact other types of MR data, in particular functional MRI or fMRI as it's called. And that's what I would like to focus on now. 
So fMRI uh, gives us some uh, images of brain activation. So it's not just one static image, image but it actually shows the, the brain as it performs a task. And this is how these fMRI data are being recorded. So on the left side of the uh, image, you can see uh, one of my colleagues on the patient table. And he has a kind of a mirror uh, on his, uh, in front of his eyes. And that is used to project uh, stimuli to him. So he can actually perform a task in response to a stimulus. And he has a keypad in his hand so he can uh, actually give answers to um, questions maybe or stimuli that are being presented to him. And then we have an acquisition of the entire brain roughly every one to two seconds. It varies a bit uh, depending on the specific experiment that we do. And this is what these images look like. So they are not as crisp and clear as the anatomical images because we take so many of them, so hundreds in a, uh, within uh, say half an hour or so. At this point here, for instance, we have a special resolution of three millimeter. So that corresponds to 48 slices and 64 times 64 pixels per slice. And then in each uh, pixel that we see here, we have a time course. So in this case here, for instance, we have about 800 images that were uh, acquired here over the course of, I don't know how much it was, like 20 minutes or so. And the red dot indicates the uh, location where the time course was uh, recorded. And if I move the red dot, you see that the time course changes and it looks pretty wiggly and almost, almost random. And now I move over to the left. I'm now in the white matter now, and that's basically a random signal. It's still random, but now suddenly at this point, you see a very clear pattern. So something evidently goes on in this part of the brain. And then as I move further out, uh, the, the signal seems to kind of disappear again. And here we are back to, to a random pattern, more or less. So what's going on here? Well, that's actually what fMRI is all about. So this is a typical fMRI experiment, uh, a so-called finger tapping experiment. So the uh, subject was asked to uh, tap uh, the, either the right hand or the left hand. So moving thumb against uh, the other fingers uh, in response to a certain temporal pattern. And the temporal pattern is um, denoted or shown here on the, on the bottom of the screen. So the, the red uh, areas are the ones where the left hand was uh, activated and the green ones uh, were for the right hand, so they alternated. And then um, you see the activation pattern. So on the left, this, uh, this bright sp uh, uh, orange uh, spot in the, in the uh, top image shows the activation in the motor cortex. And uh, on the other side, you see the activation of the other hand um, also in the opposite motor cortex. And so this is actually what we are typically aiming for to get an activation map of this type. So, but what do we actually measure with fMRI? So uh, unfortunately, fMRI is not a direct measurement of neuronal activity. Um, the pictures on top show, uh, show you what happens. So we have neurons and these neurons uh, have an uptake of oxygen if they perform a task and they uh, basically deplete oxygen from a neighboring uh, blood vessel. And uh, so these changes in neuronal activity lead to changes in blood oxygenation. And this leads to a change in the magnetic properties in the surrounding tissue and hence to a change in the fMRI signal. And that's uh, what is called BOLD, which is an abbreviation for blood oxygenation level dependent contrast. And it was first described in this paper in 1990 in PNAS by Ogawa et al. Et al. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, and, and let me show a slightly more complex uh, experiment here. So this finger tapping thing uh, is 
is almost this, uh, the easiest experiment that people can do. And it has been, it was certainly one of the first experiments that, that was done. But here's a more complicated experiment. It's called Strub. Um, uh, it, it's actually a typical uh, psychological experiment that was already described in 1935. And even before that, 50 years earlier, Wilhelm Wundt had already described something like this, and it goes like that. So you see uh, a word that describes a color, and you're supposed to say the color in which the word is written. In this case, it's easy, it's red, and here it's green. But now it's kind of difficult because the color in which the word is written um, is incongruent with the meaning of the word. And that causes some a slight delay in your response and also uh, uses or absorbs more of, um, uh, of cognitive power to actually do this task. And then you get far more complicated activation patterns. And here's an example. So the activation areas that you see on the top actually the difference between congruent and incongruent activations of, of in this troop task. But notice the, the time series on the bottom and see how, how difficult it is. So the, the red uh, uh, vertical lines indicate uh, instances where you had an incongruent uh, stimulus and the blue uh, and the green ones are the ones where the stimulus was congruent. And you see a very, very uh, complicated pattern. So why do we need math then? So the reason is that simple experiments, for instance, finger tapping, produce very strong signals that can almost be analyzed by visual inspection. Not quite, because you would have to go through every single voxel and there are tens of thousands of these voxels. And so that's not really possible to do. But more complex experiment, for instance, this troop experiment, they produce signals that are so complex that they cannot be analyzed by visual inspection alone. It's completely impossible. And that's, that's actually the reason why we need mathematics. So these, signal, these signals are so complicated, so difficult that they cannot be analyzed by just looking at them. And that's also what makes fMRI different from anatomical imaging. Anatomical imaging is done in hospitals every day in, in thousands of hospitals around the world. And uh, medical doctors just look at the pictures and they immediately see if there's a brain tumor, for instance, or a stroke or something. But with fMRI, that's not the case. You do need mathematics and you do need uh, complex software systems to analyze the data. So what type of math do we need? Well, statistics, obviously, because we need to be able to distinguish signal from noise. Lots of linear algebra, geometry, because we need to rotate all the brain into a standard coordinate system and tons of other math. But uh, what I want to show you today mostly is um, how to use machine learning with these data. So how, how can, what can we actually extract from the signal? That's what the topic of this talk should be. Now, the, um, the reason why we are interested in machine learning that uh, what, what, as, as I said before, structural MRI has always been for many years an essential tool for clinical diagnosis. And it's been used very effectively for a wide range of neurological conditions like stroke, brain tumors, Alzheimer's, whatnot. But then there are many diseases that actually evade detection by MRI. And those are in particular psychiatric diseases like depression, schizophrenia, chronic pain, and so forth. In fact, if you uh, were to image, uh, say, a depressed patient uh, and just look at the anatomical data, you would probably not see much of a difference to a normal person or a healthy person. So the uh, brains of a depressed person uh, anatomically look basically is the same as of that of a healthy person. 
Um, but obviously there's, there must be some biological reason for depression or schizophrenia, and we are actually looking now for biomarkers. So the research question that everyone's interested in is now, can we identify biomarkers, for instance, in psychiatry or for um, pathological conditions for which so far no biomarkers exist? And here we are using IQ, intelligence, as a proof of principle. So I'm not really particularly interested in IQ as such. I just used it here as kind of a uh, proof of principle to see, can we actually guess a patient's IQ from uh, the fMRI data? And the, the idea is that if we can uh, do something like that, then maybe we can also later on identify depression, schizophrenia, or whatnot. But let's start with IQ first. Now, um, uh, the data pool uh, that I am uh, have used now is uh, from the uh, what's called the Human Connectome Project. That's a huge um, uh, endeavor started in the United States. And um, St. Louis is, is one of the main uh, sites there. And they have acquired fMRI data and also other MRI data of uh, hundreds of subjects. In fact, altogether uh, 1,200 subjects, but many of them were monozygotic twins and I just wanted to use unrelated subjects so I couldn't use the entire database, only parts of it. So I have figured, uh, I found 390 unrelated subjects in this database. They were all young, healthy adults, aged 22 to 35. And then <clears throat> I used uh, what's called resting state fMRI data and also task-based fMRI data. So resting state means uh, people were not uh, instructed to perform any particular task. They were just told to uh, be in the scanner, not fall asleep, and not think of anything in particular. That's typically what people are told in resting state. That's of course kind of difficult to do because how can you not think of anything in particular? And then there's also task-based fMRI where people are actually performing a cognitive task. In this case, it was a working memory task and also a language task. And the language task also had a mathematics component to it. So uh, people were uh, given short uh, uh, sh stories, and they were also given uh, easy arithmetic tasks. And uh, so those were both tasks that are somehow related to intelligence, perhaps. But the reason why I actually looked at IQ was um, that for all of these subjects, uh, IQ test results were available. And that makes it, makes it interesting. Now, what's intelligence? Um, there's a, a large body of literature about intelligence, and I'm, I'm really not an expert in that. I just uh, used what the Human Connection Project was telling me. And they uh, identified several types of intelligence. One is called fluid intelligence. There's also crystallized intelligence. Then a mixture of the first two, which is called total intelligence and an even more general form of intelligence, which is called the G factor. And uh, the intelligence is actually measured in the Human Connectome Project using several tests. So picture vocabulary test, reading English test, a card sorting test and so forth. And you can all look that up if you wish. Uh, so it's actually a mixture of, of uh, numerous cognitive tasks that all of these subjects performed. So it's a very valuable resource for, for this kind of research. Now, as you always do in machine learning, you separate data into training into a training and a test set. You do a feature selection. Then you train a model based on the features of the training set. You apply the model to the test set and evaluate the quality of the model based on the accuracy of its predictions. That's kind of the standard way in which machine learning uh, always works. 
And uh, so what I present here is uh, preliminary results that we published uh, on our um, uh, preprint server and bioarchive a uh, couple of, yeah, about a year ago. And um, so the, the question was, can we actually predict intelligence from fMRI data, data of the human brain? So step one is um, then to split into training and test and we do the standard cross-validation. So we uh, uh, separate um, our data into actually six folds that we used here as an example for four folds. And one of the fold was always uh, used as the test set and the remaining folds are used for training. And then you do it uh, uh, using different parts of the data for testing so that uh, in the end every every uh, test subject is uh, once in a test set. And as a feature space we use pairwise correlations between fMRI time series that's also called functional connectivity that's just a term that's been coined uh, many years ago. It's not a, a very effective term because it kind of implor, implies that there's actually a connection between brain areas when really all there is is just a correlation. And the idea in, in this case is um, uh, what we are looking for is, uh, for instance, something like that, that a strong positive correlation of the fMRI time series in A and B, so the blue line here, if that's strongly uh, correlated, for instance, and maybe uh, strong negative correlations between C and D, maybe that's an indication of high intelligence. So that's the type of uh, features that we were aiming for. Of course, this is just an illustration. It's not actually true. <laughs> Functional connectivity is kind of a difficult concept because correlations between time series are really not easy to interpret. Uh, so as an example, a correlation of uh, 0.55, it can mean very different things. So on the top left, it's just a noise, a noise between or equal, equally noisy time series. Uh, but the same correlation, for instance, results if you have less noisy time series that are kindly, uh, slightly phase shifted, or you could have um, a situation on the lo lower left of the picture where one signal is very noisy and the other is less noisy, or on the lower right where you have different uh, shapes of, of the uh, signal, basically. But anyhow, that's what we do. And so we end up getting one correlation matrix per subject. So since we have 390 subjects, that makes 390 matrices. The problem here is, of course, that we have large, uh, very large numbers of correlations. So at a resolution of three millimeter, we typically have like 50,000 voxels in the brain. And so the correlation matrix is, uh, has more, more than a billion entries. It's, it's a symmetric matrix, so one can discard half of it, but still it's, it's a huge number of uh, potential features. And at the same time, we have relatively few subjects, just a couple of hundred subjects, but billions of potential features. And a uh, standard strategy that uh, has been done in this field is to do to try a dimensionality reduction uh, using brain parcellations. So the idea is instead of looking at 50,000 voxels, one uses a brain atlas uh, that depicts brain areas, typically like um, 300 or so. And then you, instead of looking at 50,000 squared uh, entries, you just look at 300 squared. But there's a downside to it because these atlases are very imprecise and you lose a lot of spatial specificity. And I personally wanted to avoid that and that's why I use a different strategy here. Uh, specifically, what I'm uh, proposed to do is to do 
dimensionality re reduction via ensemble learning. And the idea is that uh, instead of, uh, you know, reducing it using an atlas, we simply uh, randomly select um, 1000 edges from these huge matrices and apply the model to, retain, uh, to obtain predictions of the IQ for the test set based on those random edges, and then repeat this random selection uh, thousands of times. So you get thousands of predictions based on randomly selected edges, and then you average the predictions. It turns out that's actually a better, and it provides a, a, a better a spatial specificity. And that's why I propose to do that. As, um, uh, yeah, this is the most complicated formula that I have in this talk. It's about the Ricci Foreman curvature uh, that uh, Jürgen Joost, uh, uh, director at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, is, is very much interested in, and I collaborate with him on that. And uh, so the idea is to uh, not just look at the correlations between time series but to look at more complex measures at each edge. So I have better edge weights. And here in this uh, graph on the top, you can see um, the, the uh, edge that's uh, shown in, in red here. Uh, if we look at, uh, uh, at its connection, at the connection of its endpoints and include that in the edge weight, uh, then you can actually get uh, uh, much more informative uh, information about this edge than just the correlation between the two endpoints. And that's uh, what the idea behind Ricci Foreman curvature actually is. So here in the, uh, this formula actually shows you um, the exact formula. So you can have, you can include the weight both of the um, neighboring edges, but also the weights at the nodes themselves. Here in this case, we don't have uh, 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 weights at the nodes. We just use correlations as input into, into this Ricci Foreman curvature. So then uh, the more, uh, yeah, more exact uh, algorithm is actually we split the list of subjects into training and test for a six-fold cross-validation. We compute linear the linear correlation matrix for all subjects. And we repeat until convergence and average the results at the end by randomly selecting a list of edges. And we use the Ricci Foreman curvature that I explained before to identify most important edges. We use partially squares regression using the subjects of the training set and apply the parameters learned in the previous step to each subject in the test set to obtain predictions of intelligence. That's the basic idea. And now let me show some results. So the first thing we did was not look at intelligence. The reason why I didn't want to jump right into intelligence is that intelligence per se is kind of a difficult concept. And so I felt it was better not to just uh, to start with intelligence. So uh, there's another, another index which is much, much better defined and that's the body mass index, the BMI. And we, uh, the idea was, can we actually predict the BMI based on this algorithm. And it turns out, yes, to some extent we can. So we used resting state fMRI from the Human Connectome Project. And uh, the x-axis shows the uh, true body mass index and the y-axis shows the predicted. And you see that the correlation between the true and the predicted is around 65% which is way above uh, our chance. And the coefficient of determination, 40%, mean uh, absolute error, 3.01, I think, based on six-fold cross-validation. 
So we split these 390 subjects into six folds, used five of the folds for training and did the predictions on the rest. And each dot that you see here, each blue dot corresponds to one subject. And now let's, let's uh, look at intelligence. Uh, all I'm presenting here is, is really the general intelligence, not the fluid intelligence and that would go to far. It's also more difficult to predict. So general intelligence worked best actually. And uh, so on the x-axis again, you have, have the observed intelligence. That was the outcome of the IQ tests. And on the y-axis we have the uh, predicted intelligence, the results that came out of uh, our machine learning tool. And you can see here four plots, and that corresponds to the, um, uh, to the input data that we used. So on the top left, you see the language task. So that was a task where people were in the scanner and they were presented with short, uh, 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 short stories and also with uh, simple math tasks. And uh, then their brain activation was observed while they were doing performing those tasks. And you see that the correlation between training uh, between uh, the observed and the predicted is uh, around 53% and coefficient of determination 28%. So it's also way above chance. We also had a working memory task. That's what's called an NBAC task. So people are shown uh, various pictures in a, in a sequence and they are supposed to remember not the last picture that they saw, but the second last or the third last picture. That's actually a very difficult task. So you have to keep a lot of information in your working memory. Resting state is the experiment where people are not uh, supposed to perform a task, where they can just lie in the scanner and are told not to fall asleep. And at that point, the correlation is not as good. It's 37% uh, here. But when I combine, for instance, language and working memory task, I come almost to a correlation of 60%. So that's way above chance. So it's it's actually not, not so bad. We can also map back to uh, the brain and, and try to see which brain areas are really involved in this task. So uh, what I'm using here is partially square. So we get factor loadings, positive and negative factor loadings. <clears throat> and what I'm showing here is the factor loadings for the uh, language task. And um, so uh, in, in uh, the, the color code is shown on the bottom here. It's, that's kind of an arbitrary code. It doesn't have a unit to it. It just shows you which areas are more uh, involved. And uh, interesting is in particular the bottom uh, row here. Um, if you're familiar with fMRI, you would immediately recognize this pattern. So these uh, very bright red uh, patterns here. So this spot here, for instance, in, in uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this these kind of uh, uh, very conspicuous red blobs, they belong to what is called the default mode network. Uh, the default mode network was first described like 15 years ago, I would say, and it's a network that usually becomes active when you're not presented with a task. If you are just by yourself and not don't really experience any <clears throat> external stimulus, then this network typically becomes active. And so what, what does this picture show us? Well, what it shows us is really, um, and, and this is in, in the case of, uh, of the IQ, this is actually a negative factor loading. In other words, if this default mode network becomes very strong, then that's negatively associated with intelligence. Or put in another uh, way, um, if the default mode network is 
um, is very strong, you're not so intelligent. And, and what does that mean? Well, the obvious interpretation is if you are uh, highly intelligent, then you are able to suppress your default mode network in order to perform the intelligence test. And you do well on the test if you manage to suppress the default mode network. Uh, so that's an obvious interpretation. For the positive factor loadings, it's more difficult to kind of say why these particular areas are involved. <clears throat> so um, uh, these parts in the frontal brain are probably to be expected. They are associated with working memory. And so there are lots of interpretations that are possible. The, the ones, the negative factor loadings are kind of have an obvious interpretation. So you need to be able to suppress your daydreaming in order to be able to perform, to do well on an intelligence test. So with that, I would already like to come to a discussion and leave more room maybe to discuss with you. So I think what, what I've hopefully have been able to show you is that information about IQ is really clearly encoded in fMRI data. <clears throat> so the results that we observe are way above chance, but they are not as good so that you cannot really make inference, inferences about individual, individual subjects. If you remember these plots that I showed you where we have like 50% correlations between uh, predicted and observed uh, IQ, then uh, that's not good enough to actually directly infer the IQ of an individual person. You could perhaps vaguely say that based on such a test, you can perhaps distinguish if someone is way below average or way above average, but not much more. So you don't need to be afraid of that. Also here we use machining, uh, machine learning more or less as a black box. So it does not really reveal any mechanism behind intelligence, except perhaps what I showed you about the default mode network, that it needs to be, people need to be able to suppress it in order to do well on an intelligence test. But that's not really the mechanism that would explain intelligence. Uh, but then more interesting is future work. Of course, the motivation in all of what I've told you is of course to be able to go to more clinically relevant topics. So what we are really interested in is something like being able to develop personalized treatments for depression, chronic pain, et cetera. So I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a mathematician like most of you. What psychiatrists have told me about uh, depressed patients is that they basically just try out various drugs and after a couple of weeks they find out whether it works or not if it doesn't work they just try the next drug and months and months of uh, uh, testing uh, treat possible treatments um, are spent in that way it would be much better if it were possible to for instance people put people in the scanner and uh, uh, let them perhaps perform a simple task or so, and then uh, be able to, uh, uh, to make a prediction which treatment would actually be best in this, for this particular subject. Also what, uh, what we are interested in uh, would be something like early prediction of Alzheimer's. Of course, that's kind of a tricky issue because there's no treatment for Alzheimer's and people wouldn't really want to know if they are prone to develop Alzheimer's if there's no treatment. However, there are some drugs and it might be that if uh, Alzheimer's is uh, actually detected early enough that one can actually do much better in, 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 in treating Alzheimer's. So one... Uh, uh, hypothesis is that uh, at present Alzheimer, if someone is actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's symptoms actually are strongly visible, then it's already too late. That at that point, too much of the brain is actually damaged so that drugs uh, would not be effective anymore. And therefore 
it might be uh, even if there's no cure for Alzheimer's, uh, if Alzheimer's is in a late stage, it might still be very useful for uh, if it were detected uh, early enough. Uh, what stands in the way uh, to make progress on these uh, kinds of uh, questions, actually, that we would need tons of data. So not just a couple of hundred, but we would need thousands of data sets. Uh, luckily, there are so many um, initiatives worldwide where people are actually developing uh, large databases that are publicly available. Uh, where uh, we can actually have access and try to uh, go in this direction. And I guess what I've shown you is actually the first steps in, in this particular direction. And yeah, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, both in Tübingen and Jürgen Joost in Leipzig. And yeah, I'm, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a most interesting talk. If there are any questions, if you come forward to the microphone so it can be heard. Anyone? I'm, I'm interested in trying to use recordings from Meg to determine between tendency more to algebra or more to geometry. Do you think that with your, with MRI, you can do something like that? You mentioned different type of intelligence. We know we are, there are at least seven types, but I just wonder if you think you can do this tendency between algebra, it's like consecutive and geometry, which is more space intelligence. Yeah, that's that's an interesting concept. Uh, I, I think it, it would definitely show up in, in MRI data. I'm sure of that. It's just a question of having data. So uh, right now, one would have to actually acquire data and devise experiments that would actually uh, highlight the differences between algebra and geometry. But yeah, you're right. Ge geometry is definitely encoded in a different part of the brain. Are there other questions? Hearing them, I would thank the speaker again for the most excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.